So I'd like to start with a quote from one of our modest and soft-spoken uh, researchers here. Uh, gradual type systems empower programmers so that they can gradually enrich scripts with types as they perform maintenance work on the program. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to call this the gradual typing thesis. And there are a couple of key uh, elements of this thesis that I've highlighted here on the slide. Uh, we want to gradually add types, and the purpose of adding these types is so that we can uh, do software maintenance. And there are multiple ways that we can view this thesis. Uh, one of them, uh, as PL researchers, uh, here at eCoop, many of us are PL researchers, um, we value sound gradual type systems. And we, and we uh, value soundness because we know that soundness is useful. And in particular, soundness enables things like reliable check documentation and compiler optimizations and other benefits. But the purpose of gradual typing is for software maintenance. And so putting on our maintenance programmer hat, we want a practical gradual type system. And for practical uh, software, we need both expressiveness in the gradual type system. In other words, it supports the programming idioms that we use in real programs. And we also want the gradual type system to be performant in the sense that it shouldn't ruin the performance of our programs when we add type annotations. And so based on these two viewpoints, we can look at the landscape of the gradual typing research area. Uh, and we notice that most of the papers in gradual typing right now are about sound uh, gradual type systems. So in particular, uh, papers at, here at eCoop and at ICFP, Popple, et cetera, are mostly talking about sound models and sound uh, systems. But what we want to do is, on top of this sound bedrock, build practical gradual type systems. And in order to build practical systems, we need to both support expressiveness, uh, and some papers have looked into this, uh, how to support uh, software idioms that are used in dynamically typed programs. But we also need to support performance. And for both of these things, we need to understand what the issues are in a program, so where the performance pitfalls are, what kinds of idioms we need to express. And then we also need to come up with designs to actually accommodate these things. So we need both design and evaluation. So for gradual type systems, they need to live in this design and evaluation feedback cycle. And to make this idea concrete, this talk is going to be about the design and evaluation cycle that we had to go through uh, for our gradual type system. So this talk is in the context of typed racket, which is a gradual type system, uh, or sorry, a gradually typed sister language of the racket programming language. And this talk is about our story from going to a model of a gradual type system to an implementation. In other words, uh, in the terms of the previous slide, we want to go from this sound foundation that we built up in Oopsla 2012 to this implementation that, has, that we try to get both expressive and performant. And as part of this uh, story, there are three key contributions that I'd like to talk about. The first is that we propose a performance evaluation method for gradual typing, which we believe is the first of its kind. Second, we, uh, we talk about an uh, expressiveness evaluation uh, for our gradual type system. And third, I'd like to share some design lessons for object-oriented gradual typing. I'm just going to talk about two in this talk, but uh, there are more that we talk about in the paper. So to talk about these contributions, uh, first, I'd like to present some background so that we're all on the same page. And so I'm going to explain how Type Racket works and how its particular flavor of gradual typing works. So Type Racket is a uh, macro-level gradual type system, which means that we work on a module-by-module -module granularity. Uh, and in this talk, I'm going to show modules pictorially using these orange boxes. Uh, actually, boxes in general. The orange boxes mean they're untyped. And programs are just collections of modules. And so we can, take, uh, we can take a look at one of these programs and inspect one of the modules. And inside, we'll find some racket code here. It starts hashlang racket, which means it's in the untyped racket language. And inside, we'll have some definitions and expressions. Uh, for example, we might define some classes and use them. But what we can do is use typed racket to gradually type this program. And to do that, we change the language to the typed racket language and we add some type annotations. What we have to do is add type annotations to all of the exports, for example, classes that we might export from this module. 
And then the program is gradually typed. Uh, and here I'm gonna show uh, typed modules as these blue boxes. And if we zoom into the interaction of the modules inside of our program, uh, we see that th uh, the typed and untyped modules have to agree to some interface in order to interact. And in Type Racket, we express these interfaces with types. But these interfaces also need to be enforced, uh, in particular when the untyped part of the program interacts with the typed part of the program. And to do so, we use contracts. And so when a typed module uh, imposes an interface, uh, for example, the integer uh, type here uh, on an untyped module, then we need to enforce that with a, with a contract. And so we're going to compile types to contracts and put them on module boundaries between the typed and untyped parts of the program. And in this case, for an integer type, we can actually just immediately check that using an integer hop predicate. And if we have a different type, like the string type, then we use a different predicate to check that. But if we have a more interesting type, for example, if we have a higher order type, like an object type sitting there at the interface, then we can't immediately check uh, this interface. And so for enforcement, for sound enforcement, we need to delay this check. And so we use the standard Fiddler and Felicen technique of higher order contracts to turn this uh, uh, contract into a dynamic wrapper to delay the checks. And so this object here, the yellow box, ends up getting wrapped in a contract wrapper. And that wrapper is going to uh, have some enforcement for each of the methods on this object. Uh, and for example, uh, these pipes here show the input and output to a particular method. And on the input to that method, here colored blue, we're going to check that with another contract, the integer predicate. And on the output, we'll check that with the string predicate. And so the labels here show uh, or the colors here, sorry, uh, show who is responsible for the parts of the interface that are represented by these pipes. And so that's, that's uh, the, the dynamic checking part of gradual typing in a nutshell. So now I'm gonna move on to talking about uh, what the um, object-oriented part of type racket looks like. Uh, so in particular, uh, racket, so type racket has to support whatever idioms that the racket programming language uh, uses. And object-oriented programming in Racket uh, consists of, uh, or t sorry, takes he a heavy advantage of mixins and first-class classes. And in this context, mixins are just functions on these first-class classes. And so this code example here, which you don't have to read, uh, is actually taken from some real code that implements the Dr. Racket IDE. And what it's doing here is that uh, each of these lines is a function application. It's applying a mixin, uh, and at the very bottom of this code, it's applying it to some base class. And so the stack of mixins gets evaluated at runtime and constructs a new class that implements the main editing window of Dr. Racket. So the point of this code snippet is really just to show that mixins are heavily used in Racket, and so we need to support them in type Racket. And uh, just as an aside, the, uh, the text that's shown in that text editing window is actually the text that implements this talk. And so to support these mixins, type racket necessarily uses structural subtyping uh, for, for its uh, object type system. And we also have to separate class types from the class definitions. And that's because when we apply a mixin, we generate these new classes at runtime, and we can't give those static names. Uh, so we can't use you know, nominal typing uh, like some other systems like Java do. So in type racket, we have both types for classes and objects. Uh, so a class type contains uh, all of the types for its fields and methods, but in addition, it might contain things like the uh, init clause that you see here in this example, which specifies the constructor arguments, or it might contain uh, additional constraints on inheritance that an object type doesn't have to consider uh, because objects don't have uh, any notion of uh, extension or inheritance. On the other hand, an object type, like at the bottom here, just has the types of its fields and methods. So in particular, I'm gonna stress this again, types are not just the names of classes here. So to wrap up this background, uh, type racket adds types on a module by module basis. And the we need to install dynamic checks at these module boundaries. And sometimes these dynamic checks might take the form of higher order contract wrappers. And the racket style of object oriented program, uh, programming requires structural typing. Now, now for the technical part of the talk, uh, I'm gonna start a little bit in reverse and talk about the evaluation criteria. After all, this is gonna be about a design and evaluation uh, cycle. 
Uh, so the evaluation sort of is two-pronged. The left prong is about the expressiveness of the system, and the right prong is about the performance of the gradual type system. And so for expressiveness, we might ask questions like, uh, how much work is required to add type annotations to your program? Or does the gradual type system support the type reasoning in the actual program? And we tested this out uh, by adding types to real untyped racket programs uh, that we collected from users. And actually, most of these were GUI programs because uh, it tends to be that object-oriented programming is used for GUIs mostly in racket. And now on the other hand, for performance, we want to ask how fast uh, can our programs be using a gradual type system. But actually, for gradual typing, the right question to answer might be this one. How slow is it? And that's because gradual type systems suffer from the cost of these dynamic checks. And so we ask questions like, how slow does it get in practice? And in what situation are the dynamic checks that we install for soundness costly? And one thing we might worry about is that these contract wrappers that I talked about might end up accumulating in more than one uh, level as they pass through multiple uh, boundaries between modules. And so uh, to summarize, the evaluation criteria we need to talk about are both expressiveness and performance. And uh, throughout the design of the system, we go through this uh, design and evaluation loop where we will try adding types to a program and we find that it doesn't actually work out because we don't support all the idioms. So then we have to add a new design feature to make it work. Or maybe the performance doesn't work out. Uh, and then we go back and evaluate it again using our new system, and we keep doing that. And through this process, uh, we found several lessons for uh, object-oriented gradual typing that I'm going to talk about uh, in this next section. And each of these design lessons comes in the form of a problem that we found in a real code base, and then a solution that we came up for it uh, that we then integrated into our design for type bracket. So first, I'm going to talk about this left prong, the, the expressiveness part. Uh, so w one thing we found is that the structural types that we want to write down uh, for the GUI standard library are actually very complex, and we had a difficult time initially in our prototype system. And there are two reasons that uh, these types are so complex. One is that classes can have complex interfaces, and often they're mutually recursive, depending on uh, other classes, and have lots of methods, you know, upwards of like 245 methods or more. And so this picture here on the slide uh, has, shows a dependency diagram for a subset of the classes we use in the GUI library. And what you'll notice if you look closely at this uh, graph here is that there are both self-loops and mutually recursive uh, loops in this graph. And that means that there is self-recursion and mutual recursion in these class definitions, which in turn means that the types also have to express the same kinds of recursion. So we need a syntax, a notation, for both kinds of recursion in the, at the type level. The second problem is that, uh, remember that class types are separate from class definitions in our system. And as a result, when we write down the types for each of these classes in our class hierarchy, here the picture shows a subset of the class hierarchy of the GUI library. If we end up writing down all of the types for all of the methods in each of the classes, then we'll end up duplicating the code, or sorry, the types for uh, classes higher in the hierarchy in the types for classes lower in the hierarchy. And we don't want this kind of code duplication. And so to get around these, oh, and sorry, uh, one thing I want to note is that there are over 76 GUI classes in the real hierarchy, so there's a lot of code duplication, potentially. So to redu reduce the burden of writing types in general, type racket comes with type aliases, uh, which I've shown an example of here. And um, basically, you can define a type alias like path string, which is actually defined in terms of a different type. Here are the, the type union, string, and path. So to solve this problem, we need to extend this uh, already present notion of type aliases in the type bracket to do even more. So first, we implemented this notion of a generally mutually recursive type alias. And the point of this type alias is that you can write a type like uh, the button type here, where you can just naturally refer uh, back to the same type in the body of the type. And similarly, you can have mutual recursion between types like your bitmap and bitmap DC that refer to each other. And this looks pretty simple, but implementing this 
uh, is actually a little tricky because you end up needing to do an analysis over the entire module to pick up all of the types that are potentially in these cycles. So you, what you need to do is something like a connected components analysis, Tarjan's algorithm, and then when you find non-recursive cases, you don't want any overhead from using, it, say, an environment or something. So uh, non-recursive uh, types will be compiled a little differently than the recursive cases. And you might wonder, can't we just express this using simple mu types that we have in other programming languages? Well, it turns out that you can, actually. There's been some talk about this in the literature, but it's really, really painful. So in particular, to express a very simple mutually recursive type like the uh, the even and odd uh, list types, you end up needing to use something like four separate type aliases in this extremely confusing construction. So we don't want to do that. So for the second problem that I mentioned, the, uh, the code duplication, what we did was we allowed class types to reflect the inheritance structure of the class values that we have. And to do that, uh, we use this hash colon implements clause that you see here. So the combo field class is a subclass of the text field class. So similarly, its types have to be related in the same way. So the combo field class here at the bottom will use the hash colon implements clause to basically copy over the types get value and set value that are in the type of its superclass. And using these two features, we can make writing down the types for the classes we have in, in our standard libraries more tractable, or really possible at all. So that was expressiveness. We found uh, an, a problem in the performance side as well, uh, and that problem is that sometimes higher order object contracts can have an extremely high overhead. And the reason for that is that you can imagine that we have this uh, typed and untyped module situation again, and where the type module is performing some kind of tight loop on an object. And in that loop, it does some method calls to a, a class that's implemented actually in an untyped module. And so the method call ends up traversing this typed untyped boundary. And so if this object gets, uh, sorry, if an argument object gets passed in to the untyped implementation, then it ends up getting wrapped with a contract wrapper because it went through this boundary. And if the untyped method returns the same object, maybe after mutating its state or something like that, then it goes through the boundary again and ends up accumulating another wrapper. And if we do the same call again on the same object, we end up wrapping it yet again. And so you can easily imagine a linear growth of these contract wrappers, uh, which is really bad, actually, because each of these wrappers will have some delayed checks that come with it. And so you end up doing an extra linear amount, or sorry, an extra constant amount of checking work every time you go through this work, and that's pretty bad. And so to solve this, um, whoops, uh, we, had to, we had to optimize unnecessary higher order wrapping, contract wrapping for objects. And we, use this, uh, we do this by leveraging uh, some uh, uh, APIs that the underlying contract system provides to us that lets us check if a particular contract is stronger uh, than another contract. And we avoid adding a new wrapper if there's already an existing wrapper on that object. And this approach was inspired by work on space-efficient gradual typing by people like uh, Herman et al. and Seek and Wadler. Um, but uh, our system is slightly different because in, unlike working on uh, things like cast and coercions, we work at the level of contracts, which is a little bit different. Uh, but the point here is that this is not a new problem in theory, and um, there have been a bunch of papers that have already talked about space-efficient gradual typing, but what we found is that through our evaluation, this problem actually occurs in real code that users might write. So to summarize here, the two design lessons that I talked about here were that we needed a flexible type notation that can support the recursion and inheritance that we have uh, in our programs. And second, we need space efficiency, especially for object contracts. And this brings me to the evaluation that we did to actually find these problems in the first place. So on the left side here, for expressiveness, uh, we added types to 12 racket code bases, uh, and we wrote about 5,000 lines of code, or sorry, uh, it ended up being about 5,000 lines of code total for these case studies with type annotations added. And we wrote some additional 6,000 lines of infrastructure code, uh, which primarily consists of um, all type definitions for the entire GUI standard library, which as I mentioned is quite complex. That's why there are so many lines of code. And all of these code bases use O features, and some also use mixins. And we also mostly succeeded in accommodating the O patterns, but uh, we also tried a 13th code base, uh, but we couldn't add types to that because we, didn't, we don't have bounded polymorphism in type bracket yet, and it needed that. 
Uh, and uh, here I've shown a snippet of the uh, evaluation table that we have in our paper. And uh, what this shows here is the lines of code in the final program with types added, and also the percentage increase of each of these uh, lines of code from the untyped original program. And it ranges from 2 to 23%. But overall, the increase was about 15% across all of these code bases. And that's a little worse, uh, actually, than uh, previous evaluations that have been done on type bracket for functional code. And we think that might just be because object-oriented code might have more coupling or more interfaces that need to be type annotated. But we're not sure about that. The bottom line here is that we think that our system is expressive enough, at least for the examples that we tackled. Uh, there's still some limitations. But we need to do better on the lines of code needed for type annotations. On the right prong here, how does it perform? Uh, so Ben Greenman gave a talk that presented some of this approach at STOP earlier, but I'm gonna give some of the more details of our evaluation, at least our preliminary evaluation. So the state of the literature is that there have been no comprehensive evaluation methods so far for gradual type system performance. And uh, so we wanted to set out to use this gradual typing thesis that I talked about in the first slide to come up with a new evaluation method. And the idea is that we want to simulate the maintenance pro process on real programs and see what the performance is like. So in a, in a gradual type situation, you start out with a fully untyped program, and you pick a module to, type, uh, to add types to. And you pick another one that you might add more types to. And finally, you, it might end up fully typed in the end. But there were lots of possibilities for choosing where to add type annotations here. So if we look at all of the possibilities, it becomes a complete lattice of possible choices of adding types to modules. And what we want to do, what we, what we propose, is to take each of these configurations for particular benchmark programs and try running them as a benchmark and see what the timing is, see how bad the overhead is due to these boundaries. And so we did a preliminary evaluation here, and we looked at two of our case study programs, and we want to answer questions like, are there good paths through this lattice? Uh, is the fully typed performance okay or is it bad because there's still overhead in the fully typed case? And are there pathological performance uh, overhead cases? And our uh, very conservative hypothesis was there, there wouldn't be any order of magnitude slowdowns. So here's one of the fully explored lattices for the acquire benchmark, which implements a distributed board game. And what we see here is that the percentage slowdown relative to the untyped configuration for each of these configurations uh, is, is marked on, the, on the, each of the lattice nodes. And the t fully typed performance at the top here is pretty bad, actually. And that's because it is, interacts with some base uh, libraries that are in the untyped runtime system. So there's still overhead from these dynamic checks. And we noticed that there are only, I highlighted a couple single digit uh, overhead ones, and there aren't that many. So this program is actually pretty bad. There are very few good paths through this program. Actually, basically no, no good paths through this program. Uh, but for this Go Fish benchmark, which implements the, the card game of the same name, we find that there are lots of cases where, there are, where there's single digit overhead. And in the type case, there's no overhead, which is what we would expect in an ideal situation. So many paths have okay overhead at some point uh, in this program. So it's sort of a, you know, it's, it's mixed and it depends on the program here. Uh, but we definitely had performance pathology. So this initial acquire benchmark uh, that we had had exponential slowdown. In other words, we would accumulate two to the n contract wrappers for n crossings of the type to untyped boundary. And this was really bad. Uh, but just trying to make the performance lattice here helped find uh, this problem. So we found the evaluation method was pretty useful for us. And so what these evaluations tell us about the future work is that the type annotation burden for our system is still too high. And what, what we want to do is explore design work on our type notation and maybe explore nominal typing like some other talks here at ECUB will talk about later in the day. Uh, space efficient contracts are important. And the dynamic overhead of these contracts is still too high. So we might explore things like jitting or nominal types uh, and so on. Uh, and that brings me to the end of my talk. So I want to conclude with two takeaways here. The first takeaway is that evaluating performance of gradual type systems is crucial because there might be performance pathologies in there. And we propose looking at the lattice of all type configurations for particular gradually typed benchmarks. Uh, and this is still a work in progress for us, so you might expect more work from us on this at a later conference. Second, gradual type systems should be designed in this design and evaluation feedback cycle. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks. Quick question about your acquire benchmark. You said it was a distributed something something, which presumably means there was a network involved. Uh, how do you eliminate the time of that? Uh, so it's originally a distributed board game, but we disabled the networking portion because it has two modes of operation. So we use the non-networked mode. Um, did you, the, the points in the lattice that you showed, did you generate those by hand or is it something where you started with a fully typed program and then automatically um, created the uh, points in the lattice from that? So what we did is that we have two versions of each module, one with type annotations added, one which is the original program. And what we did was we wrote a script to combine all of these modules together uh, in all of these combinations and then we benchmarked them. So <clears throat> I was delighted to learn that the work that um, Cormac and others and then Jeremy and I have done, um, and also there's a more recent paper by uh, Jeremy, Peter Timan, and myself, um, that that's not just a corner case, that it cropped up a lot in practice. But you didn't say a lot about your implementation. Could you say a bit about what you've done? Uh, yeah, yes, so our implementation uh, for the optimizing these contracts is actually not very general. For, the, for, the, uh, for now, we've just implemented it for object contracts, uh, but we haven't implemented it for other kinds of contracts. And that's because so far we've only seen this accumulation of wrappers uh, to be really bad for object contracts. But in the future, we might try to make this more general. So your high order contract checking technique could be complemented by adding annotations to your high order entity. So you would have functions, methods that are actually annotated with the types that they support. And then you wouldn't need this, uh, late, uh, le this late checking approach. Have you considered that? That would take away a lot of uh, performance hits. Uh, so that's a good point, but the, uh, so for type bracket, we have some design choices that we've made that make this a lot harder. So because type bracket is implemented as a macro uh, language on top of racket, we actually have to erase all of the types. And so we can't keep around these types to do this kind of checking. So we'd have to do a lot more work to get this kind of uh, uh, cheaper checking. I, I was a bit conf I was a bit confused by a comment you made at the beginning. You said you'd need to add the wrappers, which is the source of the overhead, for soundness. Now I can see that you need to add wrappers because you get early uh, error detection with the wrappers, but you've got objects here. They're already encapsulated. You don't need wrappers for soundness, surely. Uh, so what I meant was, uh, so soundness in our case also includes that our blame tracking always blames the correct party. And if you don't add wrappers, then it's very difficult to get the blame to go to the right modules. Right. But the, th so there's another axis you can make a trade-off. Right? You could just eliminate some of the runtime checks and get performance back. And if you don't get any errors, any runtime errors, well, then that was fine. And if you do, you could turn them on again, wait patiently, and get the better error tracking. Uh, so that's true, but um, I guess the point here is that as PL researchers, we want to try to aim to do the best possible kind of soundness we can get. And then if that completely fails, then we'll try to compromise and do these other kinds of designs. The last question here. Great. So um, this is wonderful work. I've really enjoyed the talk. Um, I get maybe this is maybe a comment and a question. Um, so um, one thing, so this experiment about like what's the performance of gradual gradual type systems, um, something to keep in mind is, is sort of how the racket and typed racket is implemented. And so I think it's fair to say that the typed racket implementation, even though it does use some information about the types for optimization, it's still there's still an awful lot of of things about the implementation of Racket that are really geared towards dynamically typed languages and, and, then, and therefore have a lot of extra overhead because of that. And so I think that just shows that there's still a lot of future work to be done, it, very much in the direction that you're proposing here in terms of exploring what's the ultimate performance that we can achieve. Is that, I mean, was that a fair statement or? Uh, so I think, yeah. yes, I agree. And uh, uh, part of the point of this talk here is that no matter what kinds of future directions we take to making gradual type systems more efficient, we still need to evaluate them and make sure to have a method that we can use to make sure we know that they are actually being more performant. <laughs>